Chapter Ten of Our Little Australian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. Our Little Australian Cousin by Mary F. Nixon Roulet. Chapter Ten. Dandy Saves the Day. It was early in the morning when the two set out, and the stars were still shining. I never saw so many stars in all my life, said Jean. It seems to me there are more in Australia than I ever saw in Scotland. Think great plenty, maybe eighty-eight, said Caddock. Footnote, the blacks can count only as high as their ten fingers. Anything above this they always call eighty-eight, though no one knows why. Their way lay through a less beautiful part of the country than any Jean had seen before. It was a wild and lonely land close to the edge of the scrub, beyond them only sand and spinifex. A fire had swept over the wood and left the trees gaunt and bare. They waved and tossed their gray branches like demons, and Jean shuddered, as on every side the ghostly trees seemed to hem her in. They came to a clearing where the trees had been cut down, and these, bleached and white, lay on the ground in a thousand gnarled and twisted shapes, their interlacing branches seeming like writhing serpents. Many of the gum trees had been killed, for the cuts in the bark had been made too deep and the bark hung down in long strips. No friendly animals or piping forest songsters chirruped a cheerful welcome to this scene of desolation. Only the solitary widow bird hopped about hunting for insects and piping her mournful little note. Then the sound of a curlew, like the gasp of a dying child, came to them through the dawn as the sun rose red and pitiless over the sands. Beyond these were the mountains, rising straight up against the sky. Huge gray boulders made a wall at the base of the ridge, and the whole place seemed so strange and eerie that Jean cried out, Oh, Caddock, we don't have to cross these sands, do we? I'm afraid. No, Missa, said Caddock wearily. His foot was hurting him cruelly, and he felt discouraged. We go another way all through the wood. Missa not feel afraid. Where's Missus Bayame? Take care of black boy, not take care of white child? Yes, indeed he will, said Jean, feeling ashamed that the black boy should preach to her. But I can't help being afraid. It seems as if we would never get to mother. Little Missa get there some day, but Kadok not know how soon. Think best way now to hunt for road, and Missa go long quick for herself. Kadok foot not let him go very fast. Well, I think I won't, said Jean indignantly. Do you suppose I would do that when you've been so good to me? We'll go as slowly as you have to, and I'll take care of your foot. I'm terribly hungry, Kadok. Can we eat now? Not eat here, said Kadok, who liked the place as little as she did. Walk little more round edge of sand. There find water hole in woods and eat. So they trudged on in silence for another hour, gradually leaving behind them the sandy scrub, and coming to a pleasant wood where a carpet of maidenhair and coral fern reached knee-deep in tenderest green. Velvet brown tree ferns rose in the air, wearing a feathery coronet of fronds, and above them grew the sassafras and the myrtle. A thousand sweet scents were wafted through the air, and a bubbling stream surprised them by gushing forth from a clump of bushes. Little Missa rest here and eat, said Kadok. Plenty water, as he explored the banks. Oh, Kadok, how lovely it looks, she cried. I'd like to bathe in that water, it's so clear and nice. Very good thing, said the boy. Kadok make eat. Little Missa go to the bushes. Let water run all over self. Keep her from being thirsty all day while we walk. So Jean splashed in the cool water and enjoyed her bath like a little nymph behind the thick screen of bushes. She smoothed up her hair and came forth refreshed and rested to find Kadok had made fresh damper and toasted some bits of meat, gathering also some of the sassafras leaves and making a kind of tea which was very good. She ate and rested while Kadok bathed his foot and filled his water bottle, and then they started off again, tramping this time over a hilly country. They had to take a long rest in the middle of the day while the sun was hot and both were very tired. There was nothing to eat but damper and some roots Kadok had found, and the delay and the scanty meal did not make Jean feel any more cheerful. The day seemed the longest she'd ever spent, and when twilight fell and they found no shelter, no friendly cave nor deserted hut, the little girl felt more forlorn than she had ever felt in her life. She tried hard not to show Kata, for she saw that the boy was suffering far worse than he would admit. "'What are we going to have for supper?' she asked. "'Not much eat,' said he. "'Damper all gone, no more flour, no meat.' "'There's plenty of water anyway,' said Jean, for they had followed the course of the stream all day, and now camped beside its silvery ripples. As she spoke, a stir in the water caught her eye. "'Oh, Kadok!' she exclaimed. "'Why can't we have fish?' 
No can catch, said the boy wearily. Too bad foot to go hunt. Watch me catch a fish, said Jean sturdily. I used to catch trout at home. Let me see, what can I use for a line? She thought a minute and then clapped her hands. I know, you just rest, Kadok, and see what a good fisherman I am. She took a pin from her belt, bent it, and tied it to a strip of cotton torn from her skirt. This line she tied to a branch from which she stripped the leaves. On them she found some fuzzy caterpillars, one of which she used for bait. Then she threw her line and sat down where the stream turned at right angles and made a deep, quiet pool. She waited a long time. Three or four times she had a bite and failed to land her fish. But just as she was growing discouraged, there was a jerk, then a long, steady pull at her line. Come help me land him, she called to Kadok, and the boy hastened to her aid. Between them they pulled in their fish, a fine speckled fellow which Kadok cleaned and roasted on a flat stone, heated red hot. The fish was delicious, and there was plenty for both of them so that they felt far more cheerful as they rolled up their blankets to sleep. It was Jean's first trial of sleeping in the open, and it was long before she could rest. She lay and watched the stars, of only a few which she knew the names, though Orion seemed like an old friend, and the cloudy path of the Milky Way a broad road to heaven. "'Little Miss and not sleep,' said Kadok. "'Her afraid, devil, devil? "'No, Kadok, I'm not afraid,' she answered. Peruna he owl, very good spirit. He big man spirit, lives above clouds. He not let devil devil loose tonight. Too many twinkle lights. Devil devil likes darkness. Miss a try sleep. Toward morning, Jean was awakened by a crackling in the bushes. Kadok, she whispered, wake up. Kadok not asleep, little miss, he whispered in return. I hear something in the bushes, she said. Is it one of those bad blacks like I saw at the cave? Too far away for bad black. Think ghost, maybe, said the black boy who, with all his courage, had the blacks fear of ghosts. "'I don't think there are such things as ghosts,' said Jean steadily. "'Plenty ghosts,' said Kadok. "'One man of my tribe go to near tribe, and he saw Wuri left alone with no life in it. Over door was crooked stick, pointing to where family had gone. On ground were pieces of bark covered with white clay, so he knew someone dead. He followed tracks and found dead body in tree. It was bound with knees to chest, tied with cord made from acacia bark, and was wrapped in rug of possum skins. He turned back rug and saw face of friend. Then he wept and went away. He walked from place of death and heard a great chattering of magpies. He turned to see what made magpies make so much noise, saw a ghost of dead friend. It had followed him from the tree. So I know there are ghosts, little Missa. This ghost sounds to me as if it went on four feet, said Jean, and I don't hear it any more. I'm going to sleep. She listened for a while but heard no more. In the early morning she was awakened by feeling something cool on her face. She sprang up with a cry of terror, which promptly turned into one of delight. Dandy! My own dandy! she cried, throwing her arms around the pony's neck. Oh, Kadok, here is my pony. He has wandered away, and we must not be far from Gerinalem. The little pony seemed as pleased as she, and Kadok's face lighted up. Little miss, take road with pony and ride safe now. Say good-bye to Kadok and run long home. Jean stamped her foot. She was so angry. You make me angry, Kadok, she cried. Here you've taken care of me all these days, and now you want me to run off and leave you? I don't think you're nice at all. You shall come with me to the run. You can ride when your foot is tired, and I'll ride part of the time. It can't be far now. You go catch a fish, and we'll have breakfast, and then we'll start. Kadok looked astonished as the little fury scolded, but he obeyed, and soon a fine fish sizzled on the firestone. They started off for the main road, which Kadok said was not far away through the bushes, Jean riding her pony and feeling bright and cheerful. When they reached the road after several hours riding, she saw that Kadok was limping painfully. She jumped off the pony and said, You must ride now. I know your foot hurts, and I'm tired of riding and want to walk a while. Get on, and I will walk along holding Dandy's rein. Little Missa get very boss. Time Missa get back to white folks, he grumbled as he climbed slowly on the horse's back. Jin never say do to Kadok, but Jean only laughed at him and trudged along. It was an odd picture on which the Australian sun shone, the black boy on a pony led by a white child in tattered gingham, and two travellers scanned the couple curiously as they urged their horses along. Catching up with the children, they would have passed, but Jean suddenly cried, Father! Fergus! Jeanie, what on earth? But the rest of her father's sentence was lost as he clasped the child in his arms, and Jean knew that her troubles were over. There was a terrible hue and cry, Lassie, when it was discovered that Dandy and you were lost, said her uncle that night as she lay, tired but happy, her mother beside her, in a corner of the big couch in the morning room at Gerinalem. 
Scouts were sent everywhere, but you seemed to have dropped off the earth. Parties have been searching ever since, but no one has been successful in finding even a trail. We traced you to the place in the woods where you got off your pony, but beyond that there were no tracks. Caddock says that the black who took you did not mean any harm. His gin was nearly crazy over the death of her child, a little girl younger than you, and he wanted to take you to her to see. They had heard of you from the gin to whom you gave a curl. The blacks think that when a black dies he returns to the earth as a white, and he wanted his gin to see you, thinking that you might be his own child come back. "'Poor child, you have had a dreadful time,' said her Aunt Mildred. "'Oh, no, except that I was worried about Mother, because I knew she'd think I was killed,' she said. Her mother held her close. "'I would have been, if it hadn't been for Caddock.' "'Good Caddock,' said Mr. Hume. "'His foot is being taken care of now, and he shall have a good home for the rest of his life on our run.' "'Oh, Father, are you going to have a sheep run? I'm so glad,' cried Jean. "'Yes, we got back from the gold country just in time to meet you.' I made some money, but I am never going back there. Fergus has no end of adventures to tell you, but it is no place to take you and your mother, and I don't want to leave you again. Oh, I am so glad we'll be near Uncle and Aunt Mildred, said Jean. Not me? asked Sandy mischievously. Oh, you, of course, said Jean. We are going to be Australians ourselves now, and of course we won't forget our little Australian cousin. The End End of Chapter 10 and of Our Little Australian Cousin by Mary F. Nixon Roulet.